I feel honored to be here in this new beginning that you are standing in. This is a new beginning. You, some of you may be attending the same building, but you're not on the same path. God is doing something new, and he's doing something new, and I shared it even on Friday night. Whenever you enter into a new season, you need to spend time seeking God and hearing from God, or you can miss what he's doing. When something new has happened, you can't keep doing the same old thing. You, you're not going to get anywhere new if you just keep doing the same. In fact, I would say to you, not only is something new going on with Insight Church and this, the people that gather here and in Skokie, but God is doing something new in the world. Everything stopped for a long time for there to be a divine reset. And everybody knew we cannot be the same people that we were before covid that God is wanting to do some things, and I honestly believe that God does want to do something significant. So I shared something Friday night, and I'm sharing something today to say, how can we begin to connect to what is the new that God is wanting to do? So I want to share what I feel like is one of the most important kinds of messages. What did God put me on this earth for? What am I here for? Why am I in this time in history? Why am I in this part of the world? What does God want to accomplish through my life and through this place? Because you know God's purpose for you is bigger than just your individual life. So let's look in the Bible. I love the Bible in the sense that it is the story of God working through people. And you see people that joined God and people that missed God. And you see how their life was blessed and how they blessed their generation and how other people missed what God was doing and literally sent the generation that was going with them into a darker and more difficult place. So I want to, before we read the word, say a prayer just to invite the Holy Spirit to speak. Father, you said that we could have ears but not hear. We could have eyes but not see. We could have hearts that do not understand. So we come here and acknowledge my human ability is not enough. I need spiritual eyes to see, spiritual ears to hear, and a sensitivity to your Holy Spirit to receive. So right now, Holy Spirit, I invite you, speak to me. Just even say it in your own voice. Speak to me, Lord. Open my understanding. Open my sensitivity. Do not let me be locked into a narrow view but open me up to receive. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I'm going to read out of Jeremiah chapter 1. Because as I said in the Bible, you see God working with people. You see people that went with God, like Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Daniel. They went with God, and God affected whole cities and nations through them. You see people that didn't go with God, like Adam, Samson, King Saul, Solomon, and you see that things were deeply affected by their choosing to not trust and follow God. But Jeremiah is somebody that went with the Lord and began to go into what God wanted to do through his life. Let's look at Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 5. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Go to verse 17. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them, wherever I command you, do not be terrified by them. I will te terrify you before them. Today, I make you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but you are not but, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord." I love this because there's so many things it reveals about God. First of all, it says, even before you were DNA, God knew you. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. You're not some, uh, some, your parents may not have planned for you, but God planned for you. I was adopted. I was born in 1963. That means I'm 58, so you don't have to calculate. And so I, that, they did not have abortion then. And I was born, the, a 16-year-old girl got impregnated by a 21-year-old man. They did not want me, plan for me, or I was uh, an intrusion into their life. But I was adopted, and God planned for me, and God knew me even before I was in that womb, and he had purpose for me. And I say that to you, 
that maybe people don't see the potential, but God said, even before you were born, I knew what I wanted to do in you. And it even says that you were born again. You didn't choose him. He chose you. You didn't find God. God chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit and fruit that would remain. And you realize God has purpose for me for a reason. And he's saying, Jeremiah, even before your womb, I knew you. And I had a purpose for you. When you were born, God didn't say, now what are we going to do with this one? He said, even before you were born, God put gifts in you, calling in you, purpose in you. He even has set apart the time and the place that you would live. Even that we live in a difficult day, God knew you could stand for him in this day. That you could fulfill purpose. That you could be courageous to carry out the will and purpose of God, even when people want to come against followers of Jesus Christ. He said, I knew you. And then he goes on because Jeremiah started saying, I'm only young. Many times we look at ourselves and we say, there's not much to me. And he's saying, it's not about you. It's about the one who chose you. Moses didn't part the sea. God parted the sea. Moses just was willing to trust and go with God. See, it's not about you. And, and, and Jeremiah is saying, I'm young. I can't do this. And he said, don't worry about that. I'll put my words in your mouth. And he goes on to tell him, you're going to stand before nations. You're going to stand before the leaders of the nation and said, they will not overcome you, but you will overcome them. And you will fulfill the purpose. I love what Pastor James is saying about our giving when we can have a poverty mentality. But our poverty is not just with money. Our poverty can even be with our esteem of who we are in God. We can begin to diminish ourselves. The enemy is constantly trying to feed a negative narrative inside of you that you can't, you won't, you never, you can't do this, you can't. No, I have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. He's already defeated all the weapons of the enemy. I have been brought out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God. I have been adopted and brought into God's family. He has chosen me to be a part of his purposes in this day and time. I'm not a spectator. I am of a participant in the purposes of God in my generation. Amen. Somebody say amen to the Lord. So he's saying to Jeremiah, there's purpose for you. You see, God created you for purpose. He commits to fulfilling that purpose through you. You can reject God for sure, but God is committed to seeing what he puts you on this earth to do to be fulfilled. You do not have to fear that. It doesn't matter if anybody stands against you. God shows throughout time that even if the whole government stands against you, if you keep your eyes and your heart in his hands, he will take you through whatever obstacle may come. He's going to protect you even when people try to steal your opportunities or your path. He will see you through. God has never abandoned his servants that he's called to his purposes. So I come to say, in this day and time, God is calling people to rise up. We're not just spectator Christians. If you would ask me, what is COVID meant to do in the body of Christ? Because you know, many times the governments, the scientists, the, the, the media people, they don't get what God's doing because they don't know God. And so many times what God says, when you see these things happening, he says, if my people who are called by my name, if they, they've got eyes to see something is bigger going on than just a pandemic. There's something more to this than just that. And I believe with all of my heart, God is wanting to raise up a, a, a church that is no longer compromised, spectating, and just watching from the grandstands. But they are beginning to say it is time that we begin to go after the Lord. It is time that we begin to live lives that are sold out to God, that are going after God. We're not so self-consumed that it's all about me. No, it's starting to become more and more about him, that I can decrease, and that truly that he has more of my life than I've ever, ever given him He's calling us to tear, stand away from these fears and these things and begin to go after him. I really believe God wants to do a great move upon the earth. Even as I go into Africa or Asia or South America or other places, you see that there is a people that are hearing the call of God. Come to me. Come to me. Don't stay where you are. Come to me. Give me your whole heart. It's time to seek the Lord. It's time to lay down those things you know that, that are holding you back. 
It's time to let go of those things that are kind of pressing us down. It is time that we begin to rise up and say, let us go after God. So I want to talk today because I believe this is a time of activation. Really, a time of people being activated. It's almost as though we sat, we went through everything, we saw things getting the way they are out there, and we know something needs to happen, but we don't know what it is, then COVID hits. And through all of that, you begin to realize people are, you know, we need, we need to begin to do something different here. We can't stay where we are. We can't stay on this same path. I don't know what it is. I just know God's calling me to something more. Anybody agree with me? God's calling me to something more. I don't know how to get there, but I know he does. I don't know what all I need to do, but I know that if I follow him, he will lead me to the center of his will and purpose. So today, I want to talk about destiny. I want to talk about what did God create us for and how do we begin to start moving in to the purpose we were put on this planet. One time I was talking, I have kids that are in their 30s, and I told them there are key moments in life. You know, in your pur- when you go through puberty, you have to begin to learn how to deal with sexuality. If you don't learn well, you can make some big mistakes. If you do, God can begin to build a foundation that will carry you throughout life. You get into the college age, the 20s, you got to really begin to say, where am I supposed to go with my life? If you miss that, you can wander for a decade or more. When you get into your 30s, you start seeing the strongholds that are in your life. The things like the fear, the self-reliance, the things, the controlling nature. Because you're afraid. And you realize, I really can't get to what God has for me if these things stay in me. These things have to be brought. The woundedness. I have to let go of this. If I don't move with him, I'm going to stay shut down. And in your 30s, if you don't deal with that, it's like you double down into that bondage. But if you let him, God, deal with it, he opens for you. I remember I was 36 years old, and I was doing church work, fully giving myself to do that, but I knew there was so much more God wanted, and he told me, you've got to let go of your life. Do everything Jesus tells you one day at a time, and he will lead you to the center of my will and purpose. That was my breakthrough moment. Am I going to let go of my life? For me, it was letting go of control. For some people, it's their heart because they got it so bottled up. You get into your midlife, then you really are hit with the crisis. Am I fulfilling why I was put here, or am I missing it? And some people just go off and try to, Rev themselves with a new car or a new this or a greater that, and then you realize it still doesn't fulfill. Then you get into your latter years, you're supposed to be leaving legacy for people. You're supposed to be depositing in them. And I'm saying to you, it doesn't matter where you fall in that spectrum. There is a battle before you of whether you're going to, because even people that are older, you can still redeem whatever time you have and live it for the Lord. Amen. What is destiny? Many times to discover what something is, you have to understand what it's not. Many people, when you talk about destiny, it's bigger than your gifts. It's bigger than your calling. Like, I'm a pastor. I could say, my destiny is be a pastor. No, my destiny is bigger than that. It's not just a job or a role or a place of service. Everything the enemy wants to stop in you is you fulfilling the purpose God put you here. Because if you fulfill that purpose, you're going to push back darkness and cause the kingdom of God to manifest upon the earth. So what is destiny? First of all, destiny is not fate. The Bible's definition of destiny is different than what Webster defines destiny. Webster defines destiny as the predetermined or inevitable course of events beyond the power or the control of people. That's the way Islam defines destiny. It's like you have a fate. You can't affect it. You can't change it. It's just what's going to happen regardless of what you do. That is not the Bible's definition of destiny. The Bible talks about destiny as God created you for a purpose. He created you with intent. He put you on this earth. He gave you gifts, opportunity, and experiences because he wants to work through your life. But you have the choice whether you'll fulfill that or not. He says things like, for these plans I have made you in Jeremiah 29. In Ephesians 2.10, he says, for you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. 
It says in Hebrews 12, 1, let us run with endurance the race set before us. That God has literally set something before you to go with, and as you surrender to him, he can take you into it. These are plans that God has written out. These are plans that God wants to do, but you have the choice to whether cooperate with God or not. Solomon had a course set. He had a father who mentored him. God declared, declared to him, if you'll walk with me, you're going to see me do this through you. And for the first half of his life, he did. For the second half of his life, he didn't. You see, you have a choice. Whether I'm just going to go after what the world holds up, or do I want what God created me for? And some people, I tell you this, there's a battle to whether I really give my heart to go after what God has. Because we start fearing, but what if God doesn't have good dreams for me? I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. They are good. They are for a hope and a future. You see, destiny is for us to begin to engage in that. I second thing destiny is not, it's not other people's dream for your life. Ted Turner, which he know he founded CNN, told a story about his dad, and he said when his dad was, had a dream of being a millionaire back in the day when that was a big thing, and he reached his dreams, and he, gained, he, he had earned a million dollars. But then he said, I want to be a multimillionaire. So he went after that. After a while, his dad killed himself because he had reached, gone for those things, and there's nothing more to live for. And Ted Turner said as almost like a happy thing, well, he reached his dreams, and then it was time to go. And you realize that many times people have dreams for us. Our parents had dreams for us. Our spouse has dreams for us. Other people can have dreams for us. We can try to make dreams for our kids. But divine destiny doesn't come by just what people dream for you. God created you for a purpose. God has divine destiny. He communicates to people. And I tell you something. I was at a college speaking one time, and they said, how can I know what God's plans for me? And I said, start giving him the control, and he will start speaking to you words of destiny. When you start surrendering to God, he'll start telling you things he wants to do through you. He'll start speaking, I want to do this. I want to. And he, even when you first surrendered to Jesus and really gave him your life, he starts putting desires in your heart of what he wants to accomplish through your life. See, it's not other people's dream. God has a dream for you. I remember one time I was praying for my oldest son, and I was crying out for him and praying for him. And God started telling me, I love him more than you and your wife love him. I have plans for him that are bigger than any plans that you have for him. You don't even understand the fullness of what I want to do, but I entrusted him to your love and care. Now begin to give him to me and let me lead him into the purposes I have for him. God's plans are bigger than our plans. Hallelujah. When God first spoke to me in 2001, when I started just surrendering control and everything, he started saying, I want to take you as a prophetic voice to nations. I, I literally didn't even know what that meant. I mean, honestly, I was grown up in a denomination that nobody, prophets were back there in the Bible. They didn't have any play. And, and if you had a picture of it, it wasn't good. It wasn't positive. I literally cried and said, I don't want that. I had no concept of what God wanted to do. And I would say most of us don't. It's bigger than anything we've ever thought for ourselves. Destiny originates with God. He's our creator. It's developed and brought forth by God. And as you walk with him, in fact, you see the people that didn't fulfill destiny, there was a point they told God, no, I'm not going to keep going your way. But as they begin to walk with him, God would fulfill his plans through them. Look what King David said in Psalms 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Because God had such knowledge and David knew he had knowledge that he didn't have, David lived his life seeking God, yielding to God beginning to allow God to be the director and the Lord of his daily life. Because he knew, God, you have plans. They've been written out in your book. You know what battles I'm going to face. You know what doors are going to open. You know how to prepare me for what's coming. I'm going to seek you. 
because you're the only one that can lead me to that place. Destiny is not just for a select few. Many people think destiny is for Billy Graham or for T.D. Jakes or for whoever they think is a big wig. That's for them. It's for Pastor James and Pastor Sharon. It's not for me. Who did Jesus pick? Fishermen, tax collectors, prostitutes. That's who turned the world upside down. In fact, he says he takes the ordinary things to confound the wise. Destiny is not just for a select few. You have a role to play in what God is doing. You have a role to play in what he's doing. In fact, I would say to you, because he chose you, he's declaring to you, I have something for your life to do. And your life will lack meaning and purpose until you connect into that. If all your life is about is like making money, paying the bills, going to this, planning a vacation, then eventually you retire and then you die, you've missed the point of your life. There's more to it than that. So let me go to this. What is destiny? I'm going to put, tell you four things, and I want to unpack this a minute. What is destiny? Destiny is your identity in God. Everything that God intended for your life. Think about the people of the Bible. Abraham, you are the father of nations. Gideon, you are a mighty warrior. Jeremiah, you are to be a prophetic voice to nations. John the Baptist, you are the forerunner for the Messiah. Paul, you are to carry the message to the Gentiles. This is who you are. If you don't know who you are in God, then you go around struggling for who you are. And there's a battle in our day and time for identity. How do you find identity? It's in Christ Jesus that you find identity. It's in giving yourself to him because he has something big for you than you can even fathom in your own mind. And the devil every day of your life is trying to tell you you can't do it, you're nothing, nobody loves you, you might as well not open up, they're still going to reject you. He's trying to sell you a negative narrative so you never get up and rise up and say, God, I believe you chose me. I believe you died for me. I believe you brought me into your family because you've got a purpose and I want to be a part of that purpose. I want to stand before you on that final day and you say, well done. What I put you here to do, you gave your heart to do. Amen. Paul, in his last days, said this, I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. I finished the race. I know there's a crown laid up for me. Think of that. If you take hold of what God put you on this earth to do, you had to fight a fight of faith. Because every part of hell tried to stop you from continuing on. You had to keep and hold on to that faith when other people gave up. Whenever I read those words, sometimes I get tears because I think of times when I've been in other parts of the world, when I've been standing there before those moments that you could just go back into kind of just watching. And I knew that I just had to hold on to the Lord, hold on to the Lord, hold on to the Lord. I want to say to you, friends, to fulfill what God created you for is the only way you begin to find out who you really are. And there is more to you than what you think inside your mind. And when you begin to hear those words, you don't get full of yourself. You get full of a desire for him. Because you realize, I can't fulfill that without you. Amen. I have faced forces that I felt like I would even call them. That spiritual force is intimidation. And I would say, if you rise up to fulfill your calling, you're going to face intimidation. And intimidation is going to push on you. And if your answer isn't pointing them to Jesus, it's going to be able to push you back. Jesus Christ knew you before you were born, and he's the one that declared what he wanted to do. Not you. You didn't pick it. He said it. And as you walk with him, he'll say it again, and he'll show you again, and he'll work through you again. And so when intimidation comes to push you back, you'll say, no, 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 no. I am here for this reason. This is why I was made. Do you ever see Jesus walking around? I always get 
so encouraged by him. I mean, he said, for this reason I was born. They tried to make him, you know, like the celebrity of the town. I can't stay here because for this reason I must go around and fulfill what God had called me to do. They pick up stones to kill him. He doesn't get terrified. He says he knew that his time had not yet come. He just kept walking. You can't stop. You can do, design to do what you want, but it isn't going to stop what God, because I know my time has not yet come. His disciples could be doing whatever. I mean, he's looking at them thinking, are you guys still arguing about who's the greatest? You don't get what we're doing here yet. But he just kept his eyes on the Father. There's a reason that God made you. And as you begin to live for that reason, God will begin to fulfill purpose through you. Many times we've been in an, a season, and I'm going to tell you, with, without doubt, the season has changed. What we were in before has changed in this time that we're going. We need to begin to understand, what are you wanting to do, Lord? And as God begins to speak things over your life, don't push them away as though there are feelings of grandiose, like ego or something like that. No, the narrative we usually hear for most of us is negative. It is diminishing ourselves. It is trying to steal hope and faith. As God begins to declare who and what he wants to do in your life, begin to give yourself to him and let him unpack it, build it, establish it, because that is who you are in God. Abraham could have done a lot of great things, but if he didn't stand to be the father of a nation, he would have missed who he is and his purpose. Second of all, destiny is your life mission. It's everything your life is intended to accomplish on earth. You know, there's a lot of great things going on in the world, but I know why I'm here. I know what my purpose is. I know what my message is. I know why I'm supposed to go to places. So I don't go to places to be a speaker. I go to places to fulfill the mission that I have. Abraham knew that he was to become a great nation so that all the nations would be blessed. Joseph knew that he was the forerunner of God's people in Egypt. And it doesn't matter what they threw at him. He kept his eyes upon God. The enemy is going to constantly try to tell you it's never going to happen. You're never going to get there. It's not going to work. And you keep your eyes upon the Lord and watch the Lord fulfill what he wants to do. Samson was born to be the prophet to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. David was born to lead God's people into their purposes John the Baptist was to make people ready for the coming of the Messiah. Paul was to bring light of the kingdom of God out into the dark Gentile world. Paul said this about himself in Acts 20, 24. I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Imagine you saying this. It doesn't matter what I have to go through. I have to finish why God put me on this earth. Amen. You want to get a fired up church? Get a church that is about the purposes of God. Because they're not here to just listen to a teaching, get a little encouragement so they can go about their own thing. They're here to get equipped and, and, and even begin to be in inspired and spurred on so that they can go out and can carry out the full purposes that God had put them on this earth to do. Paul said this too in Philippians. I love this. He said, not that I've already obtained all this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Hear this. Paul said, I've not arrived at everything that God wants to do in my life. But I'm pressing on to take hold of Jesus because he took hold of me for a reason. You want to know why you should get up before you go to work and spend time reading the word, wanting to know him, wanting to worship him, wanting your heart released in faith and trust to him because he took hold of you for a reason. And you want to know what that reason is? Seek to take hold of him. Seek him. Go after him. Give yourself to him. This is what Paul's saying. I pursue Christ and I want to know Christ and I want to know the power of his resurrection because he took hold of my life for a reason. Understanding your destiny is understanding why God put you here. 
In Acts 17, 26, it says, For one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. He puts you in this generation, in this nation. He gave you the background, the purpose, the ethnicity that he did. He gave you the gifts and the calling and the experience because he wants to do something significant in your life. When I was 16 years old, I was in a, I lived in South Carolina in a small town, and I went to a high school of about 2,000 people. There was a crusade that came through, and a lot of the non-Christians got saved. None of them had churches or parents that even know what to do. In fact, many times their parents ridiculed their salvation experience. At 16 years old, I started holding a Bible study with about 130 kids that were attending for my high school. I had no clue how to help them grow in this newfound faith. But I just started doing it. And I remember saying at 16, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. I saw God change my high school campus. I saw God doing something in the whole atmosphere. Everything, the way people interact, the way everything was going on in the campus changed because God started moving on that campus. I started reading about revivals, started reading about when God would move over cities and nations. My heart began to hunger for it at 16, 17, 18. God started telling me at that age, give me control of your life. Let me lead you. I will take you into the center of my will and purpose. I didn't know many people that did that full extent with God. Most of the time they went to church, listened to some sermons, and went home and did their own thing. That's the Christianity that I knew. So I'm wavering between two decisions. Give God everything. And I remember I, felt, I started feeling called to go to this thing called Youth with the Mission, where they were going into lands and doing all this stuff. It scared me. It was radical. It was all in. And I chickened out, and I just went. To college, I got a degree in biblical studies. I got a degree in seminary of divinity. I went and started pastoring a church. About 37 years of age, I realized something's missing. I'm doing ministry, but something's missing. There's more to my life than this. And I started crying out to God, and he said, Jesus is the way. Do everything he tells you one day at a time, and he will lead you to the center of my will and purpose. And, I, you know, when you start getting that age, it is either keep going the way you are or yield to God. I yielded. I gave him full control. I was terrified. What's going to happen to my reputation? Where's going to happen to my ministry? All this stuff started going through my mind. But as I yielded, God started speaking the things he spoke to me when I was 16 and 17. I didn't even realize it at first. I want to take you to the nations. I want you to be a light. I want you to be a fire starter of revival in nations around the world. He started speaking that. I thought, this is crazy. What's going on? Why am I thinking these things? Of course, I never was one to think such thoughts. And finally, as I started walking this out, and God started lining me up, bringing me in line to that, I started remembering, this is what he said to me when I was 17. 20 years have passed. And I'm saying to you, I cried and I grieved and I realized I wasted 20 years. I wasted 20 years, but I'm not going to waste the next 20. I'm going to give you all. I'm going to go where you want to go. I'm going to do what you want to say. I may have to fight through the fears. I may have to fight through my, the pulls of my flesh, but I'm never going to say no to you. My answer is going to be yes. And he opened doors I couldn't open. He took me in places, stood before people. I've seen him move in nations. I've stood in police departments in the U.S., in London, and other places. I've seen things I never could have put myself in that place. And I say to you, you have a mission. Give God the control, and he'll bring you into it. Somebody say amen. amen. Destiny is your life provision. Everything your life needs in order to be fruitful. Gifts, anointings, callings, relationships, mentors, your character. I mean, he's the only one that can bring the pressure where pressure needs to be brought. Some of my breakthroughs would have never come without pressure. He's the one that can open doors that no one else can open. He's the one that can bring you into the setting to where things can be cultivated inside of you. In fact, you'll find if you lead your destiny, you will lack provision. And not just money provision, you'll lack 
the revelations that you need to carry it, the opportunities that you need to walk in it. Our provision comes from the Lord. You know one of the greatest provisions that you need is you need God to show you, I call it the rule of life, and I'll share with you why. Every time God called people into purpose, he told them how to, they must walk it to carry it out. Hear me. One time when Samson's parents were trying to have children, they couldn't. Finally, they, she, she became pregnant, and an angel came and met them, and they said, this is the way you must raise this boy, and this is the lifestyle he must lead to carry out the purposes of God. And so the father wanted to meet the angel because the mother did, and he said, hey, next time you see him, tell him to wait and come get me so I can meet him. So she does he comes and the, he asks the angel, what is the rule of life for the boy? Now, it's sad to say, Samson didn't yield to that, did he? And so he missed a lot of things. In fact, his dying act was to fulfill a part of his calling. But you see, everywhere in the Bible, whenever God would tell people to go carry something out, he gave them a rule of life. Joshua, you got to back, you got to carry the mantle now that Moses is gone. And then what has he said? Everywhere you set your foot by this boundary, this boundary, this boundary, you will have victory. But you must be strong and you must be courageous. If you get intimidated, you're going to get pushed back. Now, to be strong and courageous, you got to fight the fight of faith. And you can't have a weak day, a pity party day. You've got to fight the fight of faith. And then he said, you must meditate on the word day and night so that you're careful to carry out everything that he's given you. This is important. You've got to stay in the word. Have your heart fed on the word. He's giving him the rule of life. And he does this throughout the scripture. And as you begin to go with God, he's going to begin to tell you what God told me the very first day I surrendered. He started telling me, trust me with all your heart. And he started showing me my whole life I had built ministry out of self-reliance, out of trying to do it out of my own wisdom, out of my own strength, that I can never carry his purposes if I try to carry them. I had always had a strong sense of responsibility, but he's saying this is false responsibility. You can't fulfill my purposes. Only I can fulfill them. You have to learn to trust me. You have to learn to give me control. You have to learn to allow me to do what only I can do. And he started trying to break the self-reliance, break this depending on myself, trying to break me, carry it. And it was hard, but he started breaking it, breaking it, breaking it, till I began to see my faith rising, my trust rising, my confidence, my courage, my ability to give myself to God no matter what I was standing in front of. And I know that I know what my rule of life is. And it comes. It gets tested. There's times I stand in front of things that are pushing hard. What do I fight for? I want to stand in trust. Some people say, I don't know my rule of life. And I would say, start surrendering to God. And I promise you, you'll become clear. It's the most repeated thing he says to you your whole life. He's saying it again and again. When I look back in the 90s at what God was giving me and I was writing in my prayer journal, it was the same thing he started telling me when I surrendered. And I realized this has been my battle. Self-reliance or surrender and trust. He will give you the provisions if you're going to fulfill destiny. The last piece is legacy. Destiny, what is destiny? It's your legacy. Your legacy is what you're to hand down to those who come after you. When you walk in destiny, your life speaks. There's times I will go and we'll start talking about building family prayer altars where the family seeks the presence of God to dwell in their house. In many places, their people will cry and say, I remember my grandmother used to do this. My grandmother used to do this, but we, we let go of it. There's a legacy you're supposed to leave your family, this ministry, this generation. Do you know that Jesus sometimes would talk to generations? And he's saying this generation will be judged. Why? Because they did not respond to the coming of the Messiah. There's a legacy that we're supposed to hand to the younger ones behind us. I realize that most of the Bible had stories that the, the, the destiny that he had given to that generation was bigger than one generation. That what he was calling them to do, literally, they needed to make the way for the second generation to carry that torch and take it to a higher place than they were able to take it. 
And if a generation did not carry out, it's as though we made it twice as hard for them. We did not open the doors for them. We did not make the provision for them. We did not fight battles so that they can begin to see how to fight the fight of faith. We lost focus of destiny, and now they're going to have to search to try to find it. There's destiny God gives nations. There's destiny God gives ministries. There's destiny God gives families. Our God is a God of purpose. Everything he made and does has purpose. He has purposes that he wants to accomplish through your life. And it's not just you will be blessed if you do that. Your family, your ministry will be blessed as you walk it out. Literally, as you begin to rise up and carry it forth, it will begin to cause other people to rise up. I've gone in nations where you begin to bring the body of Christ together. You begin to do things. One church begins to pay the price to get a breakthrough. It starts affecting all the churches. Because they were a forerunner. Some of you are forerunners in this ministry. And you rising up to seek God, you rising up to be a participant in his purposes will make a way for many, many others to come. You realize that this is our legacy. It's not your money or your house or those are your legacy. It is the purposes that God wanted to accomplish through your life. When you open those up, it begins to affect people. Amen. In John 15, 8 and 16, it says, This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciple. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that would remain. He made you and put you in this time in history. He put you in this part of the world because there are things that he wants you to accomplish. He doesn't want darkness to continue. He wants to see beacons of light that are shining and radiating the glory of God. To David, he said, you had served God's purposes in his generation. His life still blesses people because he carried out the purposes of God. Paul did not go into a pity party just because he was in jail and people forgot him. He continued to carry out the purposes of God. And today, his, his ministry still affects us. There's people I read about that lived in the 1800s or other times, but because of what they did, their lives still speak today because they carried out the purposes of God. And you see other people like Eli, who was a priest in the Old Testament during the days of Samuel. His whole family lost even their their role in God's purposes because they had trampled the things God had given them and treated them lightly. You see, destiny is a big thing. He saved you because he had purpose for you. It's not just so you can go to heaven. It's because those other people out there matter to God. There's a story that I love and it's a group of people because destiny is corporate. It's not just individual. In fact, nobody in the Bible could carry out their calling without other people. Moses couldn't do it alone. He needed Aaron. He needed Miriam. He needed the people that built the tabernacle. He needed all of those different roles. There's a story back like in the 1700s, and there's a group. The, 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 the landscape of Christianity was bad. There was much co- corruption in the church. And even for those that were not super corrupt, they were self-focused. They weren't about taking the message of Christ to anybody. So these people were being persecuted that were trying to live for God. They started gathering in a place of Germany called Zin... What was the name of the place? Heronhut. Pastor James and I have been there. Heronhut. And there was a count, a a guy who had a lot of land named Zinzendorf. And people started gathering on his land from different countries. And they had conflict, they had problems because they had different traditions, different styles, different ways, different languages. They started really fighting. And so Zinzendor started calling to prayer. Let's begin to pray for God to begin to bring us together. Let's begin to seek God. They didn't realize it at the time, but they started day and night prayer that lasted over 100 years. But out of that 300 people, hear me, 300 people, they started gathering to seek the Lord. And God started speaking his heart's desires to them. He started sharing with them his burdens, what he sees. And they started getting a desire to take the gospel out to other places, to places that were unreached, that were dangerous. 300 people, they started going. Do you realize 
The first great awakening was sparked by these people because John Wesley was on a, a boat with these people who were called Moravians, and he saw the Christianity they had, and he realized the kind I have is nothing like that. I need what you have. And it started a revival in him that started spreading all across England and America. But it's not only that. They started, this was the first time non-priests were taking the gospel to places, women, men. They started going to places, and they started sharing it because they had God's burden. They changed all of Christianity. The modern missionary movement came out of these people. Awakenings came out of 300 people that started saying, let's go for God. His plans, if we let him, are so much bigger than we can even fathom. But it comes to where we say, I don't want to just live for just going to work, making money, retiring, and then dying. I want to fulfill purpose. You have identity of who I am in your kingdom. You have a mission that I am to be a part of that I can carry out because my work can be a part of my mission field, my neighborhood. You have provision, revelation, inspiration, keys that you want to release through my life and into my life. And you have a legacy that I want to leave to my children, to this generation, to this time. Friends, I believe in what God wants to do here. I've been coming here, I don't, oh, I have to add real quick, 16 years. I believe God wants to do something, and I believe you're a part of it. But somebody has to start saying, God, here am I. Don't pass me by. And I plead with you, don't waste another decade by just doing your own thing. Let us invite the Lord to begin to do in us what he created us for. You know, friends, each time I hear Pastor Mark Daniel share the word of God and preach the word of God, friends, I am inspired, I'm encouraged, I'm challenged to cross a line, to make a decision and respond to the word of God, friends. Each time the word of God is taught, it is an opportunity, friends, a call, a responsibility for us to respond to the word by making a decision, friends. You know what? That's really called repentance, friends. That means that we acknowledge in response to the word of God that some things need to change in our lives, friends. I hope today that you've been convicted. I pray that the Holy Spirit has challenged you and pointed out some things in your life that need to change, friends, as you move forward uh, by the grace of God and embracing your destiny, the destiny that God has for you. I just want to take a moment to pray for you to pray over the word of God and to uh, ask the Holy Spirit to seal this teaching in your heart so that your life would be changed and you'll never be the same. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you so much, Lord, for, for each one of my friends, our church family, um, our guests that are watching this online service uh, today, Lord, I speak your blessing over them, Lord, and I pray in the name of Jesus that their heart and their mind is protected, that the enemy will not come to steal the seed of your word, but the seed of your word will produce 30, 60, and 100 fold exponentially in their lives. In Jesus name, to the glory of God, Father, Father, I thank you, Lord God, that uh, for those who feel that time has been lost, Lord, that they're redeeming the time, Lord. Thank you that you're restoring and you're renewing, you're making all things new in the lives of your people. I speak your blessing over them, Lord God. Thank you that if any man, any woman is in Christ today, they've become a new creature. Lord, old things have passed away, and I speak by faith that all things have become brand new in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for your blessing upon your people. Amen, amen. Well, folks, if you agree, just go ahead and chat. Amen, friends, agree with us in the spirit. Uh, once again, I want to invite you to join us for any of our services. I really hope to see you back here this Wednesday, folks. I'm going to continue this series that we've been teaching on the wisdom of God. The principal thing, friends, you don't want to miss it. It's been a life changing series. And I know that God uh, has some tremendous things to reveal to you as the word of God is taught this Wednesday, friends. Once again, don't pass up on the opportunity, friends. It's always a good thing when an opportunity is presented to us to give, friends. Scan that QR code or uh, in the bottom right corner of your screen or text whatever dollar amount you desire to give to the number you see on your screen. Use your church app. Uh, go ahead and visit our website to give or you can mail your support at any time. Thanks for being a partner. We need your help. Everything that's growing 
requires more resources. And so thank you so much for your investment and your partnership with us. I just want to speak the priestly blessing over you before we go to bless you and your family for the week to come by saying the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, friends, and give you his peace in Jesus name. Always remember, Jesus loves you so much. Pastor Sharon and I love you. Be well, be encouraged. I hope you're doing good. I look forward to seeing you next time. God bless. This is a house of healing.